Hey, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for being here um, and out there. Um, welcome. This is just uh, fantastic. Appreciate you joining us for an evening with Rescue Press. Woo! Um, <laughs> um, the program will feature readings and a conversation uh, with um, several folks from Rescue Press. We'll let you know who's going to be with us in a minute. Um, so uh, many thanks to each of you for being here. I'm Mike Went. I'm the program director at Woodland Pattern. Um, and I want to begin by acknowledging that um, in Milwaukee, we live and work on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, part of North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We further acknowledge the grave evil colonialism introduced to these lands through uh, genocide as well as slavery, but also via racist and xenophobic beliefs, laws, and practices that continue to inflict harm upon black, brown, and indigenous lives. We honor those who have lived and who do live now at these intersections of identity and experience and are committed to the active dismantling of white supremacy. Um, again, thank you all so much, uh, real joy to celebrate the amazing Rescue Press, uh, um, born right here in Milwaukee, not far from Woodland Pattern. Um, before moving on to, to uh, other places, Iowa City, Chicago, Cleveland, thereabouts. Um, so yeah, really thrilled for the opportunity to partner and to do this. Um, uh, this is presented as part of a series of events, a uh, small press appreciation, AKA Visions in Publishing. Um, <laughs> uh, an ongoing series celebrating small press culture and the groundbreaking role independent publishers play in making space for new writers and literatures. Um, and in part, this was um, uh, made possible with support from the National Endowment for the Arts. So thank you, NEA. Um, yay. And NEA. -E <laughs> no, no, no. I'll workshop that one, sorry. Um, we have some pieces up. Um, uh, cover art um, from from uh, Sevi Perez, Rescue Press's creative director. So um, the easels here and here, right? Um, so of course, feel free to enjoy those um, well during the event, but also afterwards if you want to come up and take a closer look. Um, additionally, uh, there's this recently installed exhibition on the walls, um, and she was love paintings by Akandele John, and. That is in partnership, in partnership with Genre Urban Arts. Um, so thank you, Genre, and thank you, Nikisha, who is amazing. Um, so, and Marla for installing. And Marla, back there. Okay. Um, we have several Rescue Press titles for sale. In fact, there is a Rescue Press table um, out front if you're here with us. Um, otherwise, you can find us online at woodlandpatternbookcenter.com. And then just to give you a quick sort of rundown of the show, we're gonna start with some readings. Um, those will be uh, uh, in this order, uh, Carol Pagel, Zach Savage, Hillary Plum, is that right, Alyssa? <laughs> I mean the order I'm saying, is that right? Um, uh, Alyssa Perry and um, Daniel Kalachi will be reading in that order. And then we'll move from, after the readings, we'll move into a conversation period. Um, there will be a chance for questions from you all here and also you all out there. Um, here in the room, just some logistical stuff that I'll reiterate um, when we, between, you know, when we break um, for this next portion, but um, just to say it now to, I'll have a microphone uh, here that I can pass around. So it's like raise your hand. And that's so that people on Crowdcast can hear the question being read, right? Because um, all the audio is coming from the microphones. Um, and then um, if you're out there, you can type your questions into the chat at any point uh, throughout the evening and we'll field as many as we can with the time we have. Um, okay, enough of that business. So we're gonna move into the readings. Again, um, beginning with Carol, uh, Zach, Hillary, Alyssa, then Daniel. So um, first up, Carol Pagel, welcome, thank you. Thank you, Mike. 
Penny, Laura, everyone at Woodland Pattern. Um, it's true, a long time ago, uh, Danny and I lived about three blocks this way, and um, as part of our lives, we would come into Woodland Pattern all the time and browse this amazing selection of poetry. And one of the things that I love the most about it is that um, you all carry a selection that is broad, rangy, aesthetically diverse, um, and also has tons and tons of small press books from you know, from all of time. <laughs> and so it was really easy to stand there and look at those bookshelves and imagine that we could do something too and be part of that history. Um, so this is always a really special place for rescue. Um, I think I'll just like save all of my other compliments for later. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for coming out. I'm gonna read just like a, a couple of little prose pieces from um, my recent collection of essays, which is called Out of Nowhere Into Nothing, and it was published by FC2 um, in September 2020. And this is from an essay called Sinkhole Suite, and I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. Sinkhole, oh, I'll say it was inspired by a massive sinkhole three blocks down that way in front of our place in Milwaukee. I started thinking about um, sinkholes and the idea of, of nothingness. One, there was a bathtub in the kitchen. I shaved my legs while a roommate sauteed spinach and Dee perched shakily on the table, his leather booted feet tipping back a wooden chair while he belted out songs from Viva Last Blues. This was Prague, early 2004. Bush was president and we were starting a war. Each door in the communist era apartment opened to the next, forming a roiling circular river of flannel scarves, discolored mugs, knit mittens, empty wine bottles, and firewood. When you are young, there is the feeling of nothing to do. Some of us were in art school. We were always walking by the sausage stand on the way to the castle. Dobre den, we would crow when entering the corner store. I had fled my home, Chicago, in a wild grief. Oil popped in the pan as the water drained. Two. This baby I'm looking at on my phone sees nothing, says nothing, understands nothing. He's a mass of bubbly gurgles and excrement. This baby who I'm looking at on my phone is a new baby, fresh, dressed in blue with petite ankles and wise eyes. He's my brother's child named after my father. He represents more than he apprehends. Next is a picture of my niece, E, who is extremely interested in the dog bowl. E sleeps with a white noise machine meant to resemble the sounds of nothing, which for her are the muted booms of the forgotten womb. Three, items that have been swallowed by the earth. A pickup truck, a hotel, a yard, a man while he slept in his own bed, a campsite, a town, a church, a road, someone's uncle's house. A big rig, the 14th hole of an Illinois golf course, a housing complex in China, a three-story building in Guatemala, oil field equipment, trees, mushrooms, a tar pit, a water department van, an entire Oklahoma ghost town, fields, sidewalks, poles, street signs, tourists, sewers, trash. Four. Doing nothing is often the reward for having everything. If you are born into nothing, you are regularly required to do more and give more and feel worse as a sort of cost to the journey of surviving. Very few people do nothing and want nothing. If you are accustomed to doing nothing from the beginning of your life, say because someone else is doing the things you should be doing for you, you might be asked to do something for a while to prove that you can, that you are capable, and then in celebration of doing anything at all, you are allowed to do nothing else forever. For some, the consequence of doing something completely, let alone well, is to be repeatedly tasked with doing everything for everyone forever. 
It is still true that if you identify as what is called a man, quite often, after having done very little, you may relax and do no more, at least until you feel ready. Six, Lorreen Niedeker. I'm pillowed and padded, pale and puffing, lifting household stuffing, carpets, dishes, benches, fishes. I've spent my life in nothing. Seven. I don't know if I've been saying these numbers correctly. Seven. <laughs> H and I missed the Memorial Day party because of feminism. It was important to review the minutia, to convince each other that despite su such audacious effort, affronts, our boundaries would only become clearer. She was visiting for the weekend. We sat on the porch with our pamplemousse. H relayed a story in which Cleopatra, who had been banished from Alexandria by her brother, also her husband said H, and their parents were married too, such that s the siblings had only one set of grandparents, snuck back into the city, rolled up in a rug to be unfurled at the feet of Caesar. The sun was sinking. Large questions remained. Should she move to Jerusalem? If I quit now, would I work again? Satchel scooched near, licking her open wound. Do you have a legal pad? asked H. Let's write some things down. Thank you. What a good transition to let's write things down. Carol said we'll save the compliments, but um, I can't resist some. It's so beautiful to be here. It's so meaningful to be here with you all. This book and, I mean, this press, this bookstore, it's made for each other, clearly. Um, and to be here in 3D in spring. Uh, last time I was here was with Danny reading in 2011, and my feeling then was as now. Um, I wanted more time among the books. Um, some of you were here that, that time around, too. Um, I got affiliated with this press as a friend, which is how we all have been or will be affiliated. Um, they, they dared me to write a book that I said I wanted to write, and then I wrote it very quickly, and then they, get, they very formally accepted it <laughs> for publication. Um, and after that, it's been an honor to be involved as an editor, uh, an author again with another book that uh, there's nowhere else I'd want it to be, probably few places where it could be. Um, so uh, if you ask me to talk about Rescue Press in my life, if we met on a Ferris wheel and you shoved a microphone in my face and asked me what is Rescue Press, I would freeze up as I did as a child when asked what my favorite color was, because um, I like all the colors, and because it's, it's so interwoven with my life. And so there's no way for me to talk about this press or the things that ripple from it without all of it. So I'll read some poems. Um, I'm just going to start trusting that life is through all of it. Um, with this, this book uh, called Daybed by another press I love, Black Ocean, uh, Boston-based, uh, terrific work. Go, you know, buy all the books from all the presses. Um, this, is, this book was, it was written thinking a lot about delicacy and thinking about the things that are fragile or delicate um, imply worlds of care that have allowed them to persist. Uh, so that the, the thing which seems delicate is actually implying worlds of systems around it. Um, I'll just read a few from this, then maybe some brand new numbers. Like seeing a movie in the day in another city, foundling dove, I rest my hammock on the grass. Grew able to read only when very aroused. Could we be reading the same line now or say this is heaven and there is no heaven, so only this remains? If you're thirsty, it's too late. But if there may be gradations of thirst, there was this sweet bolt new bark grew around and new shapes to lock bikes to. Could it matter what the confetti is made of? Asparagus by the road. A child made a radio by resting anything in a creek. An acrobat didn't love me. 
Presently blackbirds, I watch some hammer a patio into the air. Anything a blackbird does is clean. I turn in the substantiating breeze. Purity arises, variegated, nuanced, involved. Did not the wilderness of precision double the switchgrass, seeing you tripled the pear? Civilization forgets its raincoat in the cab. I hoped to be older when driven to Proust, the melody being whatever you repeat, beautiful warbled hopscotch grid. So you see a person in a car for sale in a field. The past wasn't simpler, but memory is. My neighborhood has its own stained glass shop. I offer the business I can. Bees made a calendar. It was totally honey, graceful in the sufficient gauge. So pluck out a world and carry it before you on a dish. I'm in this jacket I wear in any season. If I took it off, it'd be trash. I'm wearing this stupid hat so you won't remember me pretty. One taught me to ascend a steep hill, bend double and swing your arms foolish. I left the shower so we could see. A divot in the glass confirmed if air is involved in the workings of a mirror, all air must similarly convey as oranges preserved in straw and heat every accent trills. Um, I'll just, I'll read a few more. Thanks so much for being here. I, I used to do some banter that some of you have heard about how the purpose of poetry readings is how we talk after, you know, what gets tuned or charged through it. So I love that this event includes the conversation after. Um, these are just, these are brand new. I was back in Philadelphia before this where we, where we used to live um, and was taking some walks I used to always take. Um, and these, these poems came from that. Uh, they're, they're short, short little guys. Uh, the first, it's a set of three called Passable, Passable Hours is the first. There are things you need to hear that no one has said or could. Gorse and vetch and colorless, nameless flowers two weeks before the crop first shows. Erosion is additive to the stream, azalea weighed as standing water in drought. As you age, one explained, the eye casts shadows of parts of the eye behind the eye. Floaters, traces, a flash. So you see inaccurate depths. Depths, however, are greatly aligned with greater precision, so you see better. Rain trims a gold mosaic. Pears ripen in dishwasher steam. It's a woodpecker when the head moves. In what genre does one hope to be wrong? Let me worry about that. There's ice in the river, it also is, and seven plants in eight pots. I'll just end with another one of these uh, recent three furs. This one called A Tree Flowering Too Fast to See. We had no choice. And then we had no choice except to stop. In a house, a storm happened to construct. In the fantasy, no fantasy would save us. We thistle the hymn. We dandelion microphone. To avoid tensing during falling, be always falling. Brook gone to bog, meaning as a marsh seeps. Two hydrants on the corner, like what kind of fire? Pillowcase on a hydrant. Shaggy frieze of peonies. Jesus fucking Christ, please just let me fart, one screamed at the bad church. This is a place there's no reason to be, so it's a place for any reason. The day takes all day to get to, a tree where lightning will be. Ice just once could smell more of apples in the pond and sap in kindling should flash. Thank you very much. Hi. 
Um, it's so, so nice to be here with all of you, small press dreamers. Um, like Zach, it's hard to separate rescue from my life, <laughs> um, but it's changed my entire life, and uh, I'd like to keep living there. Um, and I want to shout out to all of you involved in small presses where so much happens um, in the face of everything. I thought I would read because I think rescue is a place that helps you like try what you need to try. Um, I thought I'd read from something super new and let you all... Um, have to deal with it with me. Uh, <laughs> this is from a novel I was working on for a bit in the last two years, and it was, um, you know, written in the context we live in Ohio. It, as with many states, it's been suffering from an incredible kind of increasing narrowing and restriction of access to abortion through trap laws, uh, kind of heartbeat bills, and other things, but it was written before the recent um, leaked Supreme Court ruling, which threatens another fate. Um, Beyond that, so it, this in this novel, there's a, a clinic that's been shut down. The doctor is imprisoned um, for violating a new a new law in relation to abortion, uh, and we, there's an employee on hunger strike uh, named Angela in the kind of shut down clinic. And this is like a weird journal that she's keeping. She was like a pretty bad employee, but thinks this is like a good job for her now. <laughs> um, so I'll just read some little chunks from it. And one thing that's happening in that journal is that she refers to all the patients, all the people who came um, to the clinic as rows. So we'll just hear some little references to different roses. Um, yeah, I'll just read that. I don't really know what's going to happen to the novel because I feel like everything's going to change. So maybe this is its only life with, with you all. Or, I don't know. Um, all right, here's some little chunks from it. When I scrolled through photos from the trial, two crowds doing their things in front of the courthouse, I saw Rose standing to the side of the crowd, looking like I must have looked, like she didn't know what to do, just standing there wearing a windbreaker over jean shorts so short you could barely see them, her legs kind of knob neat, thigh faintly yellow. A few months ago, Rose had come up to the desk, gripping her clipboard, left first choked with little beaded bright bracelets like kids make. She'd been in for a procedure, and now she was back for birth control. She had the BC, but she didn't like it. Is there a stronger pill? I need a stronger pill, she was saying. I hear you, I said. The nurse, I don't get my period with this one, she was saying, and I need to get my period. I'm spending like so much money on tests because I don't get it. It's all about the estrogen, I said. They'll totally have to get my period. I have to know for sure. I think it all got sorted out, except that now we were closed and she'll have to get her pill somewhere else, I don't know. I keep thinking maybe the phone will ring and I can just help someone by chance, by still being here, just picking up the phone. Maybe someone somewhere hasn't heard we got shut down, so to them we're still here, ready whenever. Maybe someone else knows, but we'll call anyway, just hoping. And I'll just be here like, okay, it's okay. But no, there was an outgoing message on the system. Donna kept trying to leave the message on the last day. She kept starting, then getting too choked up. Not a problem I'd ever expected Donna to have. I can't do it, she said. Crystal, can you do it? Crystal wasn't even working. She'd just come in to take down all her beach sunset photos and psycho Hamilton fandom. And she was asking Donna, Dr. M was locked up, about medical supplies, what could be donated. She had a box in her hands when Donna called out to her. I'm busy, she said to Donna. Have Ange do it. She could see I was right there, sitting at the big desktop where I happened to be deleting some browser history. All we're doing is telling them they're screwed. They have to go out of state. Have Ange do it. Ange always sounds like a stone-cold bitch. So yeah, it's my voice, and I guess I'm the one who breaks it to everyone. We're gone, we're shut down, welcome to being 100% fucked. No, there's no voicemail. Even though I'm the one here now, huh. But for Rose's POV, that didn't matter. I can't help anyone anyway. The pills are all gone, and for all Dr. M said, it was such a simple procedure she never taught us. She never even broke the rules in the one useful way. Ever think of Rose who came in with her own magazines tucked under her arm like she didn't think we could? She could waste time correctly with our supply. She was always wearing a blouse and a flowy skirt with an elite crinkle. You can get abortions at the fancy hospital, but it costs way more, so people come here. I think they find themselves surprised by the system in place or how they're part of it. Do you need anything else? I asked Rose, who was just standing in front of my window, magazines tucked, holding the clipboard I'd given her as if she wasn't sure where to go. It wasn't that there weren't seats. She turned to me and kind of smiled. No, you've been great, she said, honestly. I was just expecting something different. Reality bites, I said. That seemed neutral. The protesters don't seem that bad, she said. I was really nervous about the protesters, but they seem all right. It's just a few women. 
Well, I said, you've never tried talking to them. Is it always like this, she asked. It was a sleepy midday, sun bright on the eyeballs and warm in the room. Two kids were playing blocks on the floor in the corner while their mom typed fast into her phone, murmuring. I was wearing jeans with shredded knees and a tucked in button down with only one minor button missing, a compromise everyone could enjoy. The TV was on like hour 81 of some home renovation show where they were only touring homes built on the actual edges of actual cliffs as if the minute filming ended, a storm would just tip the whole thing into that gorgeous sea. Between me and Rose were fingerprints on the glass and beyond her a carpet no one would call clean. Definitely, I said. We're always just offering safe, affordable, reproductive health care for anyone who needs it. I'd heard Crystal say the sentence in a different tone. There's such a big price difference, Rose said, between here and my OBGYN through the hospital. I was really surprised. I mean, I was asking her who would pay the higher price. People who don't want to come here, I said. But if you're all professionals, she said, then didn't finish. I don't think I said anything. I was interested in anyone who would suggest that about me. Is it possible to get a little sip of water, she said. My throat is so dry. I guess I'm a bit nervous. We do have running water, I said. But for you now, nothing by mouth. From the doorway, Monica called her name and back she went. Ever think of Rose who showed up one year in early spring? I remember snowdrops were blooming along the curb of the parking lot island, and I was feeling good until I walked in late, got yelled at late, and halfway through the day I had to count Rose's cash out to give back to her. I guess I shouldn't have taken it in the first place. I should have known, but how would I know? Not too many people pay in bills, damp bills, and when I gave back the cash, I knew these were the exact same bills she'd brought in. Too far gone, threshold of viability. Sorry I had to change the appointment, she'd said when I'd checked her in last week. I hadn't finished raising the money yet. And now, your money's no good here, I didn't say. The price had gone up since we'd first quoted it weeks back she'd crossed into the second trimester. And now, too late, too far gone. I didn't ask if she'd have to give it all back. Probably, if it was from one of those private funds you can call, or could she keep it to use for the kid or at least the time off to deliver? She didn't look pissed. I wouldn't say pissed. She'd zipped her purple top up snug against her chin. She nestled her chin in as she watched me count back the money. She looked like she just learned that she'd been right about something important a long time ago, now that it no longer mattered. I gotta get home, she said to me when I finished counting, and since none of my pre programmed speeches call us with questions, let's schedule your follow-up, made sense. I just said, good luck. That's it, thank you. Hello. It's, uh, it's such a joy to be here. Uh, first off, thank you to Woodland Pattern um, we've been looking forward to this for a little minute now. Thank you to all small presses for the work you do. Um, and I mean, I have to just echo Zach and Hillary to say that, um, yeah, my, my whole life for more years than I can count now um, has really uh, been a result of, of being part of Rescue Press. Um, so this is immensely meaningful. Um, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, this first one is assembled from two Elizabeth Bishop poems. It's called Filling Station. Oh, but it is a doily, a big dim doily, draping a tabaret, a big hair soup begonia, a green line frayed. Why, oh why, daisy stitch with marguerites, the doily, the doily with the daisy who can say softly, the daisy can say softly, quick and saucy, say, oh, 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 oil had spread a rainbow, a so, 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 rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. Somebody loves like the tipping of an object toward the light, the daisy, softly, to say softly, so that they can say softly, victory. So, so oftly, victory, like fine rosettes, like full-blown roses, like a pink, big peony, the little rented pool of bilge, carefuls its soft irises. And this second poem, um, 
is thinking about a trivia-based web game uh, that translates art knowledge into uh, purportedly into humanitarian aid. Um, you can all imagine how effective that can be. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, happily, uh, it's really nice to read this uh, poem about people trying to cash in on art knowledge um, in the presence of this really amazing uh, Akindele Jean work. All right, so this is freerice.com. Freerice.com backslash famous paintings. Where to recognize water lilies in woman reading a letter is a virtue, as leads to quantifiable purchase of relief food. One passes through this game to know who made the image. Eat of this. The landscape is the value of impressions seen through this window, its issuance, its multiple choice, its limited option. Fun question, who covered the canvas? Can you click the correct artist? The correct artist, if selected, will refresh the page to the next ad impression to make the cash equivalent of 10 grains of rice elsewhere materialize Rousseau's The Star. Ads in my eye philanthropize junk time. Upon arrival, ask that I consent, have forgotten what box clicked. Are these bids targeted? These 10,000 liters of water required to construct a pair of jeans. If it's spelled R-E, not aimed at me. Who wears the jeans a Midwest Salvation Army delivered whole cloth? Who sheared the legs off? Are you willing to commit to zero waste fashion? And how much does it cost to as if to make me? Cracks in red earth, whose thirst are you facing? What invisible grain are you stuffing? What crevice is it filling? About free rice, every time you answer a question right, we try to show you an advertisement. Sometimes in the ad market, there is no advertisement. Some advertisements bring more rice and rough equivalents. Your effort is not wasted. Cash represents no pre-existing pile of rice. When you trigger a payment, do you remember what your name is worth it to make this more relevant, more generative, this site, to make all the difference? Do you have to answer questions right to make all the difference, to give you a reason in theory? We could ask you to look, but we know that challenging yourself to improve is motivating. A constant reloading your name cannot make a statement, including protest. We may change it. We cannot tell you when we do this. It protects your data. We don't remember your name. All we want is to raise as much rice in your name as possible, to stay within the limits, the neutral, enjoyable. Space amounts to playing the game designed to be safe, without which our players would have no reason for all ages, from all over the world. We want the appropriate contractual relationship to cross the Rubicon to make a positive difference. This is not an endorsement. To opt into the low resolution reproduction of the painting, one must tap to show image. Image hides question, the image or the question, constable, the burning bay, whatever compounds the grain. Wheat field with crows, what is your name? Cash crow, cash crow, voice of the grain. At the World Food Program recommended rate, of 20,000 grains per person per day or other types of assistance. The UN procures from a competitive network of suppliers and local these children give the rice fairly, the thumbs up effectively, transparently. The cash equivalent of 20,000 grains is 2,000 artists. On free rice effectively in five minutes, I get 36 artists correct. In 4.6 hours, I can make the cash equivalent of food for one day for one member of the Syrian Armed Forces, or sometimes a young woman. 40% of workers in our warehouses are a woman. It takes five minutes to package a meal start to finish. The UN estimates the cost of feeding one person for one day is 50 cents US. 75% of our meals have traveled competitively by sea. As of 30 July 2020, the cash equivalent of 20,000 grains has been adjusted to $1 US. 
that is, 4,000 artists. I hope to get better at artists. The star, starry night, chair with pipe, free bilingual K-12 resources, no two little girls, self-portrait with bandaged ear, 1.5 billion tons of food wasted, no noon rest from work at the Moulin Rouge. Meat production is the main driver of deforestation. St. John the Baptist, syndics of the Draper's Guild, the world's largest lesson, La Primavera, no portrait of the artist. Global wastewater production, olive trees with yellow sky and sun, water lilies, is free bilingual resources. The world's largest lesson, the lace maker, take action, act now, every action counts. Poplars, irises, the burning of parliament, 90% of agricultural land is dedicated, self-portrait by, why does the year 2030 matter? Erasmus of Rotterdam, free resources, free resources. Here the road menders by blank brings to mind, the stone breakers by other blank, destroyed after the road menders was made, what was made after, made perhaps in light of the breakers in the hospital labor's lucidity, the menders indistinct below the plane trees, the plain air painting in Cleveland I sit, looking at this copy from the copy done from the interior, the more finished occurs the question, occluding the large plane trees, who made these plane trees, my friend Jiamin. Thank you. Hey, all. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Um, like everybody has said, pardon me, um, it means a lot to be here, not just um, in Milwaukee, which is where Rescue was started, um, but to be amongst friends and to be amongst people who love literature in a building that supports literature and that has been a building for so many of us that has meant, um, meant something quite important. Um, I was thinking while hearing everybody read how much of a family Rescue is, and that family is pretty big, um, not just in the work that we do uh, CV, who's taking photos as we speak, uh, Alyssa and Zach and Hillary, um, but also um, the work that Carol Pagel does. Uh, Rescue was really started um, based on Carol's vision and the work she does with our authors, uh, with our team, uh, is really, really wonderful. So it's wonderful to be here uh, with Carol and with the rest of the team. Uh, I'm going to read some poems uh, from my latest book called American Parables, published by the University of Wisconsin Press. Um, and then we'll take a beat, uh, and then we will have a quick conversation. Um, I was picking poems to read tonight. Th this book is a lot about uh, what's happened since 2016 uh, in our country. Um, and I noticed that a lot of these poems were inspired uh, and taken from conversations with uh, some of the people in this room. Um, so here's to friendship. Laid land. We fight about the hummus, not because I ate the contents you were saving for a party, but because our undervalued sedent democratic freedoms are at best a modern factory of dumpsters filled with ditch wood, filled with butane, in a room with one long lighter tethered back against a trigger holding out to be depressed. Click. Here, Inside this kitchen, there's a sinking orange body, fake radiant in view, collapsing on our evenings like a hormonal teenage egging. Every night, we sight the same undoing, a fever broken wet from sweating off embezzled weather, still sickened past November in this middle western wretch. My father is a Middle Eastern immigrant who shaves daily to prevent the fabricated active threat of location tracking lice from bringing shame upon our family. The anxiety, 
to celebrate what little we have left leaves us as every couple twinned together and alone. So we argue. We yell and stomp and scare the cat and one of us pretends to sleep folded on a couch. What this government can't give to us, we never wanted anyway. Get up, my river bandit. They can't take us if we rise. Uh, this is for Haley, visiting hours. To be inside the lush of life, I climb alive a tree outside the guarded rise of a hospital where you receive your treatment. Attached against my back, I have a crate of caffeinated soap and aging pediatric drinks you drink to sink your sweating. The nurses tell the officers that I am not a safety concern, but I am still concerned for your bald return to safety. In my tree, I eat peaches from a shelter can I later use to plant with hands around my mouth and yell political obscenities instead of finally crying. You have youth and roaming cancer, and I keep an articulate distance between allowing myself to think of that. At your last known apartment, the traffic throbs a swan of ruffled rivalry and everyone forgets an election has occurred. If I admit to you that none of our shared reticules have parachutes, that means we've given up. Here, at last, is the tidal wave survival recital we use to prove there's music. You will accept the invitation because there is no other way. Last poem before marriage. Inside our garden is a garden of weeds, green feeding the land around and between the Siberian kale we planted to be a catalyst for cradling our vacant disposable income. In the yeast of July's rising, we watch from our bedroom as rain brings height to all credible bull, thistle, bottle grass, ground ivy, thriving, alive and a lie, a shuttle of life, a choking of ties we can sympathize with. When we finally stand with the appropriate plan and pre-purchased refuse bags necessary to brand the mistakes we've gestated at the nail-gated entrance, you tell me you are no longer comfortable using the polythioxylated taloamine for this particular project, at least not while the neighbors are watching. I want to pull the earth clear for you, but I don't have the muscle. I want to carry my past and bury it next to the rabid Swiss chard held captive by active bright Japanese beetles, but that too requires strength and a willingness to admit that my pointed disappointments point back to me with fault. I hold the chemicals and tell you there is no other way. You hold a match, a cordless oscillating fan, and the wood from my old box spring that we agreed to sell on Craigslist after tallying up who else had slept on it. There is always another way, you say. And then we find the bunnies. No mother. Wet socks in a hamper. Huddled. Waiting to be eaten or fed. Uh, and I just got two poems left. Deviations on return. You purchased a spider, a 1981 red Fiat spider that you bought, brought home, waxed hot in the unlofted soft rot garage the same beige afternoon I first lost time to the second pass lapse of my recently bruised crude wisdom tooth surgery. In that car, you hid your immigrant image unsettled a check paved deep in your savings to add a new crisis and run off the gun. Maybe insurance insured my mouth would be served, sutured and gauze right white and pretty. Or maybe you hemorrhaged a weak year's pay without asking your wife to park the dark wheels heel pitched in our driveway, a damage still damned as you flit turd retirement. 
the tires I tired of deep in that brief post-tooth lost sleep tried to hold us well in the middle of class. Get away, I said when you brought to me ice, brought to me Arabic sliced rice prayer. You slept on the Barca lounger next to me, on the couch, the garage, your car, your 1981 red Fiat Spider. It was Passover. When I opened my mouth two workless days later, all of my friends lived in gated communities. I forget their names, the streets and the golf clubs, the powertrain engine specs I never could clutch. 25 years have shook and took with them your colon, your knees, your need to be colonized for having left home. Belief, you have said, is the grieving thief pulling damp leaves from the gutter. Guts, I never had any. You gave up the car. It lives with my sister. Night throws its sand. We are handled in airports. The band in your speakers speaks course of the country that saved you, divesting investments, still leaving me, thinking you'd have more to say. I'll stop there. Thanks, y'all. Thank you all so much. Um, beautiful readings. I would love to hear more from each of you, so maybe something to look forward to one day. Um, but for now, I'm excited to hear maybe not um, your writing, but more about the press itself and small press publishing. Generally, we're going to take a short break, you all out there and here, uh, just a few minutes to change things over. So feel free to stretch your legs a moment. We'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back, and thank you. I'm standing behind the ca camera. Sorry, everyone on Crowdcast. But um, so I'm gonna, yeah. So here we are for the conversation. Really excited for, uh, for this. Uh, everyone up here on the panel will begin by um, giving a little background on Rescue Press, among other things. But again, I invite you both in the room and on Crowdcast to um, um, ask questions. So if again, if you're in the room, if you could raise your hand, I can run this mic over to you so that people on Crowdcast can hear. If you're on Crowdcast, just drop those questions in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. Thank you and take it away. Um, my name is Carol Pagel. I think I know most of you. <laughs> uh, we thought we would just start with maybe a little bit of a summary of the history of Rescue Press and then jump into some questions about um, maybe some of our first books, editing, design stuff, small press publishing. But this conversation can really go like any direction that folks uh, in front of us or in the in the ether want it to. We're happy to talk about anything. Um, so maybe I'll start with a quick summary and Danny, you can like jump in. Um, Rescue Press was started in Milwaukee as, we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the reading um, in 2009. Uh, Danny and I both lived in Milwaukee and um, like, I don't know, like many great artistic adventures, it was kind of a spontaneous, um, I mean, we, we planned things, but we had been reading manuscripts from, um, from friends who maybe like weren't able to place their work. That was one sort of key part of it. Another key part of it that Danny was reminding me about a couple of months ago was that we had um, just taken a trip to UMass Amherst to see friends and to give a reading, and we... Um, saw that a bunch of the students there were doing all kinds of really interesting projects, um, making, you know, chapbooks and like pamphlets and like strange events and whatnot. And so I think it became, you know, um, something that we were, we were looking at out for something that we could make together. And a press seemed like one kind of experiment. So we started with Mark Ray's Smaller Half, which we might talk a little bit in a, more about in a while, and 
um, a couple of years later, brought on Sevi and Alyssa and Hillary and Zach, all in different editorial and des um, design roles. And now it's like 12 or 13 years later. Um, and we can talk about the details of any of this. Um, but it's very much, as we've all been talking about, a, a labor of love, um, something that has given us all a lot of energy. Um, I think that the press tries to be in conversation with the small press histories that we all know and love, as well as doing something new in the world. Um, we publish in somewhere around like two to six books a year in any genre we really want to, including made up ones. Um, and we're always kind of like looking to shift and change, I guess. And I say that in part because a lot of presses start with like a specific editorial project or some sort of aesthetic mission. And that has never really been a huge part of what we do. We're just sort of um, looking for the things that excite us in the moment. Um, although now that we have a much lo larger catalog, there's probably some aesthetic similarities between our books. We can, I don't know, get into those details. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Or we could start with Sevi's first question. Yeah, so um, hi everyone, I'm Sevi. I'm the creative director at Rescue Press. I've been the creative director for 10 years, so if the press is 12, 13 years old, there's not too much time had passed um, since I had joined. Um, so I design all of the books, as Carol mentioned, Rescue is untethered to any specific aesthetic, and I think that's uber important. So we try to make each book an individual title, each book has an individual intent and an individual life. Um, and funny enough, because Carol had mentioned the first publication that Rescue Press had done was Mark Ray's The Smaller Half. And in terms of just getting the conversation going, I kind of wanted to open the question, because even though I'm the creative director, I don't know why the smaller half was the first manuscript that you wanted to make, so I would like to ask you that right now. And here, I'll do this, so we can do that. Um, do you want me to start? Um, so when, when we got back from that Amherst trip, uh, you know, walking around Milwaukee, um, we thought that it would be a genius idea to start a press, with the idea that if we did it, uh, we'd probably do chat books, and then if it didn't work, we would just close up shop. Um, and I had gone to the Iowa Writers Workshop for graduate school and uh, had had some classes with a dear friend and a wonderful poet named Mark Ray. And Mark's work really uh, just has always struck me uh, in the head and in the heart. And the manuscript was just not being, as Carol mentioned earlier, just not being accepted. It wasn't doing the thing that poetry was doing at the time. Um, it may have appeared too quiet in some arenas. It may have seemed too bizarre and surreal in other areas. It might have been too heartfelt in other arenas. Um, so Carol had also read the book or seen the poems, because um, that's a whole other part of this that we'll get to in a second. Um, Mark would send me poems all the time uh, and send some to Carol, and we just had this like email stash of Mark's poem along with this version of a manuscript. So we drove to Iowa City where Mark lives, um, and we asked him at the Bluebird Diner oh. um, if we could do a chat book of his work. Um, and he said, sure. Uh, and then we did some in, uh, recon where we like asked how much chat books cost and like did some, <laughs> some work on that. And we realized it wasn't that much more money to do an actual book. Um, we went down to Digicopy uh, <laughs> off of uh, by Water Street. Um, <laughs> And like talked to 1281 Van Buren. Yeah, there you go, 1281 <laughs> Van Buren. Uh, and, and talked to them about it. And they had a, a perfect binding machine there. And we thought we'd print like 20 copies of this book. And we were going to do it on cardstock with no color printing. We were going to do this whole thing. But then we had to ask Mark if we could do the whole book. Mm -hmm. And we weren't even a real press yet. We didn't, we didn't have a website. We didn't have a logo. We didn't have any of the things to brand. At the time, it was even harder, it was much harder to even just sell your book, we were lucky to get with SPD pretty quick, but we didn't have a way to distribute the book. And Mark said, sure, and he let us do it. So Carol and I went through this manuscript Mark gave, and we went through like hundreds of emails and pulled poems, pulled fragments of poems. And one thing that I'll, and then I'll let Carol talk, but one thing I'll say that that started was, we're a press that really focuses and believes in, in editing, and it's not the idea of taking a manuscript and making it ours. It's the idea of helping someone find the best version of the book that it can be, and we want to be in conversation. I'm sure everybody up here has worked with uh, 
editors, publishers who don't edit. Um, and I think it's really important for us to just at least ask questions. And it's something we started with Mark and it was a really fruitful uh, experiment um, and an experience. And so we put that book out and we got really lucky. Uh, Carol figured out how to get us uh, to work with the distributor. We had small uh, independent bookstores like Woodland Patterns start to sell our book. We got a review for the book right away, which was kind of shocking. Uh, and then we got an email from a, another friend of ours uh, named Shane McRae asking us if he wa we wanted to publish one of his chapbooks. Then we got a note from Madeline McDonald, who's a wonderful fiction writer, and we started selling enough books that we could put that money back into more books. Uh, and then a couple months or a year later, we convinced Zach to write a book for us. Yeah, and yeah. so... Yeah, we dared him. Uh, and, so and one other thing you'll find interesting is uh, Carol set the entire text of Smaller Half in Microsoft Word. <laughs> Shameful. Oh my God. I don't. Oh. <laughs> well, and so one thing I, I wanted to say was, you know, ten, over 10 years later, we have Mark, the cover of Mark's third book yeah. here. And I, and I know Woodland Pattern is selling it out front. What were you going to say, Carol? Well, I, I mean, I just, I'll just say like one more sweet thing about Mark Ray, um, but I think it, it relates to like this sense that we had early on um, in terms of like what we wanted to do as editors and bookmakers. Danny mentioned this and Sebi, you did too, like um, taking each project at, like on its own terms. And the thing about Mark's manuscript, like the reason I think why he had been sending it out for a while to a variety of different places in a variety of different settings and it not quite um, not quite sticking or whatever is he, he's just like this genius writer of the single poem and I, I like to think of him as like the most charming lunch poet in a way mm -hmm. like his po like he he wrote I mean and I don't know if he's still I don't know you know Mark if you're watch watching us you know like I he would like write a poem a day you know like I mean he's just as like someone who poetry is part of like his daily life in this really really like pleasing and inspirational and beautiful way and so I think it was interesting to take a pile of poems like that and think about it as a book and to help someone who who you know, my impression of Mark is he thinks of the unit of the poem as the poem. And so to like have all these conversations very early on in what we were doing about like how that switches when you start to think of work as like in a unit of a book. And we can talk about um, when we ask Sevi um, maybe some design questions, I think that that first little step about like thinking of like the units or shapes that poetry or writing can like take and form that became maybe a little bit of like a guiding question such that now we have um, a variety of books that are not just like um, written in hybrid forms but take hybrid shapes or like des design patterns or you know some of our more I feel like our books get more and more goes in them as time goes by. They get sort of like bigger in concept. And that's, I think, just because we have more and more questions about like what these shapes can make and take, um, like kind of beyond and around the idea of even a book. So, yeah. Yeah. There's, and, oh, yeah. Well, obviously, there's a lot I can add there, but I don't want to, I can talk about book design all day, but I don't want to deprive the audience of. No, why not? Questions. I think that you should talk about design for a while, <laughs> and then maybe we can like scooch yeah, back to fine. editing after. Yeah. yeah. If, are there no. any are there any those specific design questions uh, that maybe anybody would have currently, or I can just start talking. Happy to do either. Yeah, that's fine. So as because oh gosh, all right, you're going to regret giving me the mic. Um, Carol's entirely correct, and one of the things that's so fascinating and rewarding about treating each book as an individual object, not as not just a book as object, but each manuscript as a piece of art, is um, I get to interpret the author, which is a which is a, a really um, rewarding and uh, uh, takes a lot of trust, and I think to to cater to grab that, or to rather excuse me to cradle that kind of manuscript and to understand what that author is trying to seek because. You know, if a lot of so, in, you know, there are some authors who um, they don't understand that eight and a half by eleven is not what a book looks like, and so you kind of have to find out some very technical and logistical 
and objective ways of re-realizing that text on a, on a smaller page or on a page that's a different dimension. Those are some very specific and very straightforward, obvious pitfalls, but there are other situations involving the pacing of the book uh, when you're presenting the reader with information and with, and with what visual emphasis you're placing on that information. I care very much about that reading experience being really fluid and that I love, I, I like when a reader can move through a book and then they close it and then they see the cover in a different light. That's also something that I care very much about and that's a theory, a little theory of mine I call the second life of of book covers. I say, you know, we have our market and commercial obligations where I, I the designer, need to take that um, author's, that creator's work and figure out a way to try to get you to want to buy it within like a five second glance at it. And that's that's got its own set of limitations. You know, you want your title to be so, so large or so small. If you have an attention grabbing visual, there are guidelines on how you'd want to do that. There are even colors. Uh, green, this is something I always say when redoing this, but green covers, for whatever reason, this is true, they don't sell as well. So you don't see a lot of green rescue covers. So those are those technical limitations. It's true, those are those technical limitations that you face up front. But then on the backside, like I said, you have to try to be true to that author and their, and their work and their writing and their text. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the joy and a lot of the, um, the struggle is, is in, the, in, in creating each book as an individual piece of art. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a, okay, so here we go. Uh, we have a, it's a chalkboard green. So when there's, so this is a great example because when the concept overrides that technical concern, I think it's valid. And, and so we're doing uh, uh, Adrian Raffel's next book, um, uh, Our Dark Academia. Um, if I may say, we'll, we'll have a, a sage dark green background. It is not the dominating element though, Danny. <laughs> I just want to be sure we're going to not, not sell the book. I got, you made me nervous. Uh, what is the dominant element? How does it the dominant element is a statue. It's a it's a it's a, a cleaved statue. It's it's very striking. It's a current. Um, it's a bust of a of a youth. It's in the permanent collection at the Metropolitan Museum. We have a, a lovely image of it that um, we're using to uh, angle the typography and just make a real engaging front cover. So I'm really looking forward to that one. It's my favorite cover in a while, to be honest. Um, and just for you all to know as well, um, the two, so Watch Fires is Hillary's book. Um, Zach's book is Diving Makes the Water Deep. I cannot take any credit for diving. That was an um, illustration that um, I just simply set. But then the reason why the other covers are here is these are the four most recent titles. So it's cr uh, the other titles are Correction, um, Gravity Well, which I mentioned was Mark Ray's third book. And then we have Basic Needs and um, PMS A Journal. In verse, which which yes is intended to look like a a uh, what a composition a composition notebook that has been thrown out the window and run over by a car and the author has thrown it across the room, uh, and so that's an example of where that's a high concept. Obviously, um, book is object. Um, maybe Mark's I could say cover is, is a little bit more traditional in terms of um, interpreting the work. It, the, it's not trying to make the book into part of the object itself. Yeah, so part one concluded. <laughs> What's up? Oh, you need a mic, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a whole system here. Thank you for the system. Um, I'm a little tangled, hold on. Technical difficulty. Could you, um, I really like that orange book. Could you walk us through like briefly the, like when you're, you're moving from the text to the, to that cover. Like, what was the process of, of that? Yeah, um, uh, Mark is a great author to work with because he does listen a lot to what um, I'm interested in. Particularly with that book, it came in without any of the moon um, uh, bits. And if you if you are to grab that book or to look at it on your way out, you'll notice that those moon phases play a much larger role in segregating the, the work that's inside the book. So none of that had existed before I had received it. Um, the lunar calendar and, and the way Mark was writing about seasons and all that seemed to really lend itself to that kind of um, aesthetic. And so I had said, well, wouldn't it be kind of neat if we had the moon kind of phasing through the book 
then as the work is progressing to not only mark a conceptual time that the author is experiencing and that they're sharing with that reader, but as, an, as a visual element to create a cool cover tie-in and to make the book just somewhat more graphical. I think when Carol mentions that we're, we're putting a little bit more time and attention to, into each book, what that can translate to is more graphics. I'm allowed to get more crazy with typeset. I'm in there moving commas and making sure everything is perfect. Is, um, and so particularly with, with that book, that's a, that's a great example of a cover again, that, or a, rather a, a whole collection that um, didn't have any of the, of the moon phasing. And, and I believe that was a, a single concept book because that's another thing we can talk about and, and that I can talk about at length is, um, is there ever a best version of the book and what do you do if you disagree, or what do you do if you um, don't, at me, saying to disagree, I mean me and the author or me and the editors, um, what do you do and how do you create that final product um, and have it be true to itself uh, in, in, in the world of constraints? So, so that's a whole other, we can talk about that too. Nobody ever asks me to talk about book design all the time, so this is great. <laughs> If there's not another question, I wanted to, oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Well, Hang on one second, we gotta give you the <laughs> microphone. It's, it's kind of an obvious question, but I am truly curious, especially after hearing about the very first book that you put together. So how did you come up with the name Rescue Press? Where did it come from? Did it have anything to do with that first book? Um, yeah, just would like to know the story about the name of the press. Yeah, people um, ask us this, I think because, well, it, it's an obvious and good question that anyone would have for um, any press in thinking about naming. And the, the truth is that we named it that like, sonically. So I was trying to think of something that sounded awesome. <laughs> So it was like press, press, what are, you know, so rescue, got to rescue. And then like it opened like a whole bunch of metaphors that felt um, attached to what small presses are and what they have been um, in specifically in the poetry world and the history of small press publishing in poetry. But I think probably all small presses, like with a sense of um, that kind of like, uh, community and maybe like DIY or scrappy spirit or just like the kinds of work that have historically been published in small presses. And so that felt, it felt meaningful, like beyond the sound. I mean, I, this is just like writing a poem, right? <laughs> you find something that sounds good and then like, it will open up what you meant all along maybe. <laughs> um, and I think other folks, you know, some of our authors or some of our readers I mean there's a lot of like sort of metaphorical ways you can think of rescuing like what a reader does for authors or what a what a certain kind of um, editorial stance can do with um, with writers and whatnot and so that's all available but I don't think like any one of those meanings necessarily is the one we stick to um, but it, I mean we all we you know are cheesy and joke too that it has rescued us in a lot of ways as well and so the the, the metaphor idea of rescuing I think it keeps on giving all the years years later good question though I always feel dorky about answering it like in the in the poetry way <laughs> uh, rhyme <laughs> yeah um, other other questions we're happy to talk about yeah bookmaking poetry fiction anything editing more editing and maybe I should, sorry, I don't want to go ahead. I was just going to like reintroduce our roles, which I don't know oh, sure. if we said at the beginning or not, I don't believe but um, Danny and I are editors and co-founders, and Alyssa is a primarily poetry editor so far, and then the two at the end, Zach and Hillary, edit our open prose series, which we do prose in a variety of ways, and one of them is... Um, is specifically through this open prose series, which we can ask them to talk about. It's our main like ongoing prose series. So that's just like kind of who you're talking to up here. And then obviously Sevi's our creative uh, director. So good. your question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A, a really unfun question. Go for T it. Talk to us about the financial 
model? The, how do you make it work? Um, yeah. Do you compete with? I'm mean, just oh. those mundane things. Oh God. <laughs> um, this is also just like an ongoing question for us. So there is not, we are not um, yet independently wealthy. <laughs> no one here has bothered to marry rich. <laughs> um, so we just have, have to hustle, you know, in a variety of different ways. And that's looked different as we've gone along. So when we started Rescue, um, you know, 12 or 13 years ago, we did not have a lot of money. It was just personal money, but it also didn't cost a lot because we only had, you know, the one book and very sort of like low overhead. We weren't um, paying anyone. And since then, we've tried to do things in a variety of different ways. So we have different um, acquisitions periods. We don't really run contests in the traditional way where we um, where we uh, take like contest fees, but we do like a pay what you want model. So it's kind of like forefronting the donation option in our open reading periods. So that is one way that we make money. We make money from book sales. And that has been, thankfully, I would say a really steady, if not huge source of income for rescue. Um, and that feels kind of meaningful to me because from the beginning till now, we've been able, we have like a really strong base audience, I think, or base set of readers. And so sometimes a single book um, or a, you know, a single event or something, we'll make more money and that will be awesome. Um, or sometimes we'll have harder times if we publish something that's like really experimental or, you know, that maybe readers aren't as accustomed to, or like say there's a global pandemic <laughs> and everything's all a little askew, you know, we, we won't make as much money, but it's, it's, it's been fairly even across the board in terms of the history, we all, um, you know, we all pitch in and donate money to the press when we need it. Um, so it's like editor supported and funded sometimes as well. Um, what else? We go to events, you know, bookstores and give readings and um, go to AWP sometimes and stuff like that. Um, it's always a, a question and it's maybe very obviously always a question, I think, for every small press. And so we also are frequently talking to editors of other small presses that we know who seem to have all the same questions we do about um, marketing and getting books to readers in a time in which like distribution is like a pretty large question. We work with SBD and a lot of indie bookstores and distribute through our websites and all those normal ways. But you're not gonna find a lot of like indie um, or small press books in, I mean, I used to say like in Barnes and Noble, but I don't even know if Barnes and Noble exists or if well, I what? want it to or care if it does, but like it just was like, one, you know, there aren't as many, one of the reasons why we love Woodland Pattern, there aren't as many bookstores. Um, and so it's just like a different, I, don't, I mean, a lot of you have given a lot of thought to this question as well. I'm not meaning to hop. Well, maybe. no, just one thing I want to say that Carol um, hasn't mentioned yet is Rescue was also kind of coincidentally a really early adopter of independent e-commerce. So we were up and running on Squarespace in 2010 or so, and it was a nascent platform. You couldn't even do responsive design then, so I had like a one desktop view, and if you visited from your phone, it looked terrible. Um, and so uh, over time, over that 10 years of having that independent list of customers, I, I, I believe that that's been a, a really significant boon. The market is relatively oversaturated now, I think, with, with those options in particular, but Rescue got in early on that independent e-com. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> but yes, I would love to hear from you all. Um, and perhaps uh, speaking to this question, which we do have one from Crowdcast, which is, um, just would love to hear more about the editing process, which I would too. So. That, 
dovetails really well with the question I was going to ask our two open prose editors. Um, let me just switch microphones. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Hillary and Zach, I believe you, you joined in about 2013, 2014. And since then, you've published um, a really wide array of prose books from Andrea Lawler's um, Gender Queer Bildungsroman, Politics, the Form of a Mortal Girl, um, to work that is in short forms, like uh, Gabe Blackwell's Corrections, um, to work that you know is is sort of running the gamut from novel to short story to various non-fictional and hybrid forms. Um, and I would love to hear you both talk more about what it is to edit that series. Uh, I'll <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll start. I was going to say money-wise, I love thinking about small press publishing and money. Um, I'm willing to talk about that for the, for the rest of my life, probably. Uh, I was going to say to you, recently I won a raffle. And <laughs> I donated the proceeds of that raffle to rescue. So there we go. Um, it was a raffle because our school decided not to have a vaccine mandate. So I got a raffle for getting a winnings for getting vaccinated. So that's a way to fund your press. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so here we are. Uh, so I'll talk about the, I'll talk a little bit about the pro series we do, which will be a way to talk about our editorial process. And, and as Danny and Carol mentioned, um, one thing I think that really distinguishes um, Rescue Press is a commitment to to that editorial process and to working really closely with authors on books, helping people develop and envision those books, um, and helping e cultivate that kind of range of aesthetics and and projects, which which require both kind of breadth and intensity and like an intimacy of attention to each project and to each writer and kind of what's possible for them. And um, and as we mentioned as a joke that's very serious, you know, like some books come into being because you know that Rescue could publish them and you are talking, to, you're talking to that press at, as we talked about with Zach's. Um, the book is called Events Film Cannot Withstand, um, by the way. Um, it's a great one. Uh, the one he wrote on a dare. Okay, <laughs> so um, the Open Pro series, I think our first book came out in 2013, and Yermanakos's tribute. Um, at the time, we were, uh, you know, there were some conversations happening on the experimental or independent small press side of fiction publishing about, you know, sort of where do you publish experimental fiction? Um, it, what do you do with work that's kind of on the borderlands between fiction and essay? Um, you know, a, a little more has happened or opened up in those spaces since then, but at the time it felt like there wasn't a, really a lot of places to um, publish work like that and places creating conversations about genre um, and, you know, what was possible in terms of like sort of narrative reportage, like things that were um, building bridges or talking between, you know, nonfiction and fiction. Um, so we started that series with the idea that you wouldn't really have to commit to a genre that you were working in um, and that your work could be, you know, interrogating genre and in that kind of experimental space. And there's not a lot, if you're an experimental fiction writer, you know that you maybe um, are lonely in <laughs> publishing terms. But not all the places. One is FCT, where, where Carol's book came out. Um, and maybe there's a few more now, but it's always been a bit more difficult just because the fiction side of publishing is, is a little, you know, heavier on the bigger presses, um, and it can be harder to do some aesthetically rangy work. So I think we, like, put out a call for, like, whatever, pro like, fiction, essays, short stories in between. I think sui generis was a word that we used once. Um, and uh, started seeing what people would send in. Um, and then Zach was, has been... Uh, a great, you know, sort of reader and screener. You know, the first step, of course, is to look at everything that comes in and talk about it and think about what is happening out there and what you think you can offer as an editor, what you think the press can offer, what sort of writing um, you want to put out there. We think about the series over time. Um, and then to work very, very, you know, closely with the writers. And I think on all of those seven books, seven? Um, I've never had to count, and <laughs> I think it's seven. Uh, um, you know, I think, you know, we all worked very closely together. Some of them are writers we knew already or um, who were, like, living in our house <laughs> at some point. Um, and some were complete strangers, you know, sending work in, um, you know, kind of that range. And some were books that, uh, you know, also, as Carol and Danny mentioned, it's like, 
I, I knew that they were out there, and I kind of couldn't believe um, that no one had snapped them up, them up like Andrew Lawler's book, which um, you know found such an incredible reception and welcoming when it came out. But before that, you were like, "What are you doing, guys? <laughs> like, why hasn't this been published yet?" Um, so yeah, we work very closely um, in a developmental online um, sense on the work, um, whether it's prose or poetry. You know, different folks are doing it, but there's a real commitment to that intensity of process and then copy editing proofreading, I'm going to cough, <coughs> sorry, um, which also um, we are all a part of, and like I think Alyssa's been a part of on every book almost, or um, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Like copy editing, late stage proofreading for everything since 2013. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we moved through all of those, those stages. Um, is there more of that? Is there more you want to say about the editing process? Yeah. Sure. Um, I just add, <laughs> echoing what was said about design, that I think the editorial process is different, differs for each book, right? And we have systems and stages, but how we do them is different. And I think the principles, I mean, I get just back, this is praise for Carol as our, our maestro. The spirit, I think, if I think of what guides the press to me, two things come to mind. One is a sense of, it let's imagine our minds are made up of imaginary conversations and books uh, contribute to those conversations. You know, uh, th we open our ears to what wants to come toward us, you know, and try to open to other frequencies that might not be getting picked up elsewhere. Um, the second might be some sense of, let's say you're at a party and you're spinning and you trip a little bit, who catches you? And then they spin and they're caught and then you spin and you, you know, and then you're all spinning. And I, I think there's a sense of inviting that spinning. Come spin with us. We will, tr we will try to catch you. And once you're caught, get up on the shoulders. Let's move around the room if you want. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe you're going to sit across the room. Uh, editorially, what that means looks like, I'm thinking of uh, Eric Anderson's book, A Stranger, which is a, a, a third-person fictional memoir considering the problems of having one life, of living only one life. Um, it went through some editing. At one stage, he took a train to Philadelphia where we were living. I met him at the train station. We got coffee. We sat in the backyard. I told him some direct things that I thought about the manuscript. Uh, a bit later, he sent a revised version that included a narrator who goes to Philadelphia, uh, <laughs> meets, meets an editor who has kind of like a really close cropped hair that's a little fuzzy on top. They get a cup of coffee. Uh, they, uh, they sit in the backyard. Some direct things are said. And that, that became you know, part of the book, which I think is an illustration of how books work in our lives, right? You continue the imaginary conversation or argument with authors who you, you know, uh, extending beyond that. Other books, it's been more straightforward. It's been closer to um, the work. I mean, another topic I'd be curious about uh, is to ask Sevi about the, the, comparing this with your work in design in other realms, and also asking uh, Hillary especially, and also Alyssa and, and Carol, and maybe Danny to some extent, your work editorially in other contexts. You know, because we, we have up here people, Hillary's worked in editing and publishing in, in many ways for a few, a couple decades, um, and you know, Carol likewise, Alyssa too. Um, sometimes what we do looks more like what happens elsewhere. Other times it looks like our backyard. Um, so that I'll, I'll just end, I'll end there. And and that's exactly correct. It's like water. You fill the container that you're in, and that's hard. And I say hard, but it's also rewarding to maintain that from the design perspective. Um, certainly, um, you you grab things, I grab things when I'm designing from, from uh, you know, a comment that could come in. There are plenty of rescue covers that uh, are the almost like the opposite of what I thought they would be, but I now agree that they should be the way that they are. And so the design process is also a, a, a significant conversation. And one thing that we do very specifically and that I, is a hill I'll die on even if um, it is can be it can be very hard sometimes is that the author when I'm working with them I want them to have a say in their cover and from my experience because I don't I, I design for other presses but um, I design in one way and that's always having the author to be a part of that that conversation that's 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 very important to me um, yeah that's 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 absolutely something that makes that makes rescue different and one of the one of the things just to just to try to answer you you had said well, how do these, uh, and 
when I'm designing, how are these any different than the other work that I do? Because I don't do books mostly. Um, well, I've, I've done books the most, but uh, the day-to-day -day I'm designing anything from a credit card to um, uh, a logo or whatever. These are the closest thing that kind of toe a line between art and design. I often get asked a lot about like what the difference between those things are and I'm not, I don't have an answer. Um, but I know and I can feel that these, the rescue books that we do together are, are examples of, of, of items that toe that line. And, it, and that's where I like to be. It's rewarding and it's lovely. Yeah. example that like feels related to everything you all are saying or maybe two examples I'm thinking of because I think we keep getting better and and like bigger and broader and weirder with the way in, in which we're all doing this and I think of um, Sarah Miner's nonfiction book that came out uh, two years ago now called Bright Archive um, which has a collection of visual essays that um, that in where the conversation around the publishing, the designing of the book informed the work and vice versa. And I'll also speak to the one we've recently been working on um, that you brought up earlier, Our Dark Academia, um, forthcoming from Adrian Rafel, where um, you know Alyssa was doing the editing on that book and I got to be part of some of those conversations. And when we were talking about the design, you know, Sevi would ask a question like, I don't remember the specifics of your question, but it was essentially around some of the content of some of the academia, the dark academia sort of like meme play she's doing. We were, you were having some permissions and design related questions that we then took back to Adrian and who talked to Alyssa about, about it. And we had like a really fun, huge conversation that resulted in this like w wiki article, poem, essay, <laughs> you know, um, and that, I think that that book, I mean, Adrian's such a uh, uh, great sport about it and like such a sort of like genius, fast writer that it was really fun to do it with her, but I would say, you know, I've been thinking of this term called like generative publishing lately, and that's maybe not how we approach every single book, but a lot of them lately where, or maybe forever, where the conversation around the act of publishing and the process of it is literally generating some of the work that goes into it as well as the design possibilities. And so what that book started as becomes like a whole, it's really, I mean, I don't know, Alyssa, if you would say 20% of that book didn't exist at the beginning of us starting to publish it. It's like a lot of what it became was the result of the act of doing it, which maybe is like a little bit in conversation of some of what Zach was talking about in a different way. And that's just due to us all talking, I guess. Um, Alyssa, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Or well, I would just add, yeah. I'm curious, but you know, th it, it, there's a model, it uh, posits a model of publication that is not about a singular author, just as health is not about a singular body, but about public. Uh, uh, streams, currents, and so I'd be curious. I'd be curious to hear about, um, yeah, any thoughts you have about um, the paradigm of editing that we've been involved in. I mean, it feels especially with with Adrian's work in particular, because as you say, she is like um, such a genius of the kind of speed of writing that I, I myself can never maintain. Um, what's important, I think is that we always come in in a conversation um, and with the idea that the book might change, such that Adrian also uh, brought to us a sonnet crown um, that was like the sequel to another sonnet crown, which is in the book, and this was maybe a month, a month and a half ago, something like that, um, and where the book is about to go to print now. Um, but there's something amazing about having such an open process in which everything is a conversation. And I mean, of course, this is maybe like the most rudimentary thing, but we don't, I don't think we position ourselves as like, well, you've delivered your work into our hands. <laughs> now we are the authority on it. It's, um, you know, it was like this easy, amazing thing 
for Adrian, well, I think Adrian writing the poem was an amazing, incredible, difficult thing, but then she could just send it to us and say, hey, I know, you know, we're, we're almost at print with this book, but this exists, what should we do? Um, and then to be able to like bring that in was so incredible. Um, yeah, and for me, even just that experience frame some of how I think about editing as a responsive process. Um, and in a way, too, there's something nice about how we are working on our own human schedules and the schedules of our authors. And while we have things like publication dates, you know, release date plans, um, we're not beholden to anything larger than the author, which is like the largest thing. And so it's possible to stay in a conversation as long as seems generative for the book. Yeah, does anyone wanna add on to that? Any questions? Yeah, I have a question over here. And then I'm just, I mean, before I hand this off, I could listen to you all like for an incredibly long time, but just being mindful of the time, um, perhaps we'll close with this question. Um, thank you so much. I, I hope that this will be a good question to end with, actually. Um, first of all, congrats on uh, what I think for a small press is already an impressive longevity of 13 years. Um, you kind of started the conversation talking about some of the continuity of difficulties. And I was curious if there are new difficulties that come with the longevity, but even more so, if there are new rewards, like new things that you're finding in the process of the second decade of rescue um, that you never anticipated in those early years. Thanks, Jake. It's good to see you, pal. Uh, I, I have a quick answer, and obviously I want to hear from others, but um, in a sort of cheesy way that those things to me tie together. So one is um, a new... Um, Oh, a, a new hurdle that we face is um, keeping up with demand, making sure that we, you know, we're sitting at home doing our day jobs and we realize that our distributor suddenly is out of a book because another author is going on book tour for a second book that they have. And we go to our warehouse, my basement, <laughs> and we realize we're, we're out of books. We knew we were low in stock, but now we realize there's nothing there. So we've got to very quickly put in an order, get it rush printed, get it delivered, all in between Zoom meetings that any of us are on, right? Because we're doing this, as Alyssa was saying, we're doing this on our time and on our author's time, but we also want to make sure we're doing this in a way that is preparing the world for the work of the author. They're working really hard on this stuff. So that has become difficult. Anytime you print more books, it costs more money, and so there's a little bit of a gamble there. The other side of that is the real advantage, the real exciting thing to me in the second decade is just our audience is, is growing. You know, when we started this down the street, I very, very, very much believed we would put out Mark's book and then we would say that was fun and that would be it. And so to not only be around for 13 years, but to know that we've got these books that are about to come out this year that we've got a pile of manuscripts that we're gonna be deciding on soon from an open reading that we held in the winter. Um, all of those things are tied together. So there's from financial to just more work, more shipping, um, more last minute, oh no, you know, inventory is low. But the exciting part is that we're, we're reaching a wider audience, more people are sending us their work, which then becomes again that same deal more books to put out that's more work that's more stuff we got to send to cv to drive him crazy uh but it also means again we're putting more work into the world so to me it's 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 sort of two ends of of a very fun sword i'll be fast i mean maybe everyone could answer this i would say that the thing that gets harder is just it's like related to what danny said is like you just have more more of everything and so it's just like more organizational tasks and more time. It's just like the same as anything that's harder feels like the same things that are hard about everything in a way, <laughs> just like having a job or something. Um, 
But the rewarding thing, I think, for me, or the thing that comes to mind immediately when you ask that question is just like, this has always been there, so maybe it's not new, but it feels more and more profound to me, is like how lucky I am to get to read all these books that come to us. And it's like, I do not get tired of doing that. And every time we have any kind of open reading period or anything, I just like, it's so fun and I learn so much and I feel like the privilege of that, like in a variety of ways that have to do with just like my own thinking and my own writing and just like the bounty of, I mean, it's just like heartwarming to see all this like good, weird literature in the world and to think like, wow, people are still doing this like we are for like no like one clear reason. <laughs> we're all just doing, we're all just like being weird and then sending each other all our weird stuff <laughs> and then loving it and then sharing it with other people. And that feels like that kind of maybe like play or surprise or, or opportunity to, like curiosity, opportunity to keep learning does not feel to me like something that is a given, like the older one gets in their like lives or careers or whatever. I, I can illuminate two very specific design responses to that question. Uh, I guess I'll lead with the negative, which is not really a negative, but it's, it's new for me, which is, um, so normally like, you know, again, these practical constraints that you have when you're trying to get somebody to purchase a product. Typically, I don't want to run covers of the same colors in the same seasons. You don't want to run different, you know, you don't want the same fonts or the same tiling styles. And so as the catalog grows, I get more and more constraints on, because I don't want to repeat something. And I also don't want to even like ref reference something or refer to something that, that we did even two or three seasons ago now. Um, on the shop page, those those don't appear that far from each other, and I and so it's it's nice as a designer because it it makes you to think in different ways, um, but it's it's a, it's an interesting constraint. Um, and as for those of you that are writers or publishers, it's also like the books that are being published adjacent to yours will also impact yours in that way, where you won't get your purple cover because the one coming out that same season has the purple cover. You know, there's that kind of stuff. Uh, but the most rewarding thing is that um, when you line them all up on a, on a bookshelf, the spine, <laughs> a half inch up from every bottom trim will be the rescue RP, and then another quarter inch above that is the bird, and if you line them all up, <laughs> that's the greatest reward of them all, because that's a game you play 10 years in advance. <laughs> 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 um, I can't wait to go home and do that again. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, I guess I'm just thinking sort of sweetly of all the joys of it right now. I mean, I, in starting to work with Rescue, didn't understand how much I would live with these books and how much they would shape my own consciousness and, um, you know, sense of the range of possibility as a writer. And I started as an intern who was really, really um, set on being like a good proofreader. Um, <laughs> and like 10 years later, I have a lot of very different ideas um, and um, editing instead in ways that are about, you know, like letting the book be it itself. Um, and so, I mean, just over, over time, you get, you get the privilege of getting to grow and change with, with books, um, yeah. I guess I would add like, um, and to the economic kind of question, just like, I worked in publishing since 2004, um, where like, we were just, we were like in the aftermath of the rise of the chain stores, which killed a bunch of indies, and then Amazon was on the rise, and it killed at least half of the chain stores, um, and now we, you know, we're in increasingly, like small presses like ours, like independent presses, and many of you know so well, you know, they exist in a marketplace that's dominated by multinational corporations that are increasingly a monopoly. Um, so the fact that we kind of exist at all is um, both a continuing difficulty and its own reward in that sense that it, I think it really matters to have independent makers of culture and have people making books with other writers um, and 
to have this kind of participatory, <laughs> you know, grassroots sense of publishing um, is for all the sense that you're like, you've kind of been shoved out of the market, you're kind of kept to the margins in a lot of ways, culturally, socially, you know, kind of in all the economics, um, you're doing something that I, I think is very essential um, and that it seems pretty like life affirming and like a making of culture. Um, that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, this has been just such a beautiful, illuminating, moving conversation, and it's so wonderful to have you all here. Um, Gerald Pagel, Daniel Kalachi, <laughs> Sebi Perez, Melissa Perry, Hilary Plum, Zach Savage, thanks to you all for joining us um, out there and here. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.